going to come and share just for a few minutes, and then we are going to highlight our service with the Living Lord's Supper as we close. All right. Well, we're going to just start in the Bible, and you can read along on the screen with me. We're going to read several passages. Mark 11. So they approached Jerusalem. They got as far as Bethphage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives when Jesus sent two of his disciples on ahead with a specific task. Go to the village over there, he said to them, and as soon as you enter it, you will find a colt tied up, one that nobody has ever ridden before. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing that? Then say, the master needs it, and he will return it at once. They went off and found the colt tied up beside a door out in the street, and they untied it. Some of the bystanders said to them, why are you untying the colt? They gave the answer Jesus had told them, and they let them carry on. So they brought the colt to Jesus and laid their cloaks on it, and he mounted it. Several people spread their cloaks out on the road. Others did the same with foliage that they had cut in the fields. Those in front and those coming behind shouted out, Hosanna! Welcome in the Lord's name. Welcome to the kingdom of our father David. The kingdom coming right now. Hosanna in the highest. In a new scene over in Mark 15. As soon as morning came, the chief priests held a council meeting with the elders, the legal experts, and the whole Sanhedrin. They bound Jesus, took him off to Pilate, and handed him over. Are you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate. You have said it, replied Jesus. The chief priests laid many accusations against him. Pilate again er, interrogated him. Aren't you going to make any reply? Look how many things they're accusing you of. But Jesus gave no reply at all, which astonished Pilate. The custom was that at festival time, he used to release for them a single prisoner, whoever they would ask for. There was a man in prison named Barabbas, one of the revolutionaries who had committed murder during the uprising. So the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do what he normally did. Do you want me, answered Pilate, to release for you the king of the Jews? He said this because he knew that the chief priests had handed him over out of envy. The chief priest stirred up the crowd to ask for Barabbas instead to be released for them. So Pilate once again asked them, What then do you want me to do with the one you call the king of the Jews? Crucify him, they shouted again. Why, asked Pilate, what has he done wrong? Crucify him, they shouted all the louder. Pilate wanted to satisfy the crowd, so he released Barabbas for them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. In the last uh, few centuries, let me move this, especially since the Enlightenment, uh, we the church have taken Jesus, the cross, and resurrection out of its Jewish context and out of its story within the entire biblical narrative, and we we have thrown it into this very platonic worldview. We've we've resigned Jesus to the job, uh, the simple job of of saving souls for, for a later date when people fly to some ethereal realm. We, we've missed the point of the story of the Bible, and we've shortened the message of the gospel to this platonic idea of souls going to heaven. We've ignored what Jesus said and meant when he said, when he taught us to pray, may your kingdom come, and may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we've inserted our name into John 3.16, forcing it to say, for God so loved Andrew, which isn't exactly wrong, but it misconstrues the idea. It's for God so loved the world. Humanity and creation that he gave his begotten son. So join me this evening as we try to very quickly to, to put Jesus back into the story, back into the historical, literary, and theological context he lived in and was working within. On Palm Sunday, uh, as Jesus rode in Jerusalem in his anti-military parade, humble and riding on a donkey's colt, the crowd cheered for him. They waved palm branches and cried out, Hosanna, Hosanna. There was rejoicing as this man that they believed was the coming Messiah, the new son of David, 
as he rode into Jerusalem, and they were excited, and they cheered. Now, growing up, sermons on this, um, at this moment, was, they were always juxtaposed with the scene five days later when the crowds are shouting, crucify him, crucify him. And it was always then asked, after they juxtaposed these two moments, how did the crowd go from shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, to crucify him, crucify him, give us Barabbas, in, short, in such a short amount of time? How do they do that so quick? They would always ask that. And as a kid, I'd say, I mean, I'd, I'd think, yeah, how did they do that? How, how did they make that switch so in such a quick amount of time? What's going on here? And even though the people teaching those lessons would always juxtapose those moments, and then they would ask that probing question, nary a satisfying or compelling answer was ever given. So to help us answer this question and to understand the pathos of the crowd, we need to go back into Israel's history a bit. In, in Israel's history, there was a man named Judah Maccabeus. He also later became widely known as Judah the Hammer. Judah the Hammer. Judah came to prominence during the crisis of the 160s BC, almost exactly 200 years before the public career of Jesus, of Nazareth. And like Jesus, the crucial part of his career was a three-year campaign, ending in a triumphal entry into Jerusalem, followed by a cleansing of the temple. But it is here that the parallel between Judah the hammer and Jesus of Nazareth ends. In Judah's day, it wasn't, it wasn't Rome that was in charge, it was Syria. Syria had taken over Jerusalem. Syria was the big bad. And the Syria king Antiochus Epiphanes desecrated the temple. And he rededicated it to the pagan god Zeus. And he was trying to, to smash the resistant spirit of the Jews by forcing them to break their holy law by eating pork. But the resistance was led by one family whose figurehead, Judah the Hammer, waged a three-year guerrilla campaign at the end of which he cleansed the temple of pagan elements. And this event is still commemorated annually in the Jewish festival of Hanukkah. And Ju Judah and his family, they celebrated their success by parading about, singing hymns, and significantly for our story, waving palm branches. Judah's victory was enough to establish his family in the roles of high priest and the king of the Jews. And equally important, they sharpened up the ancient storyline. The wicked tyrant oppressing God's people. The noble and heroic leader, risking all, fighting the key battle, cleansing the temple, and setting Israel free to follow God and his law once more. This was the story of Moses, Egypt, and, and the Exodus. It was the story of David and Solomon and the Philistines and the temple. It was the story of Babylon overthrown and the return from exile. The problem with the story of Judah the hammer only gradually dawned on the people in the next generation. Despite this early excitement, it became apparent that the prophecies had still not been fulfilled. Utopia had not arrived. The Hasmoneans, Judah's family, were far from perfect leaders themselves. But this great story, the wicked rulers, the people suffering, the hero, the battle, the victory, the rule over surrounding nations, the establishment of God's dwelling, had been etched into their minds and into their scripture reading habits. This great story, this was what the people were praying for, hoping for, waiting for, when Jesus of Nazareth came on the scene. So Jesus comes riding into Jerusalem, and he does it in stark contrast to how Pilate came into Jerusalem a few days before, riding a war horse, dressed in military garb, followed by soldiers, cavalry, and infantry, infantry. On the, Jesus, on the other hand, in line with what the prophet Zechariah had said, he doesn't come in with a show of force. He doesn't come in with an army. 
And he isn't even riding a war horse or a majestic horse or a horse at all. He's, he's riding a donkey. And it's not even an adult donkey. It's not even a grown donkey. It's a donkey's colt. It's this silly image. It's meant to be ridiculous, absurd, humble, and vulnerable. But the crowd at that point, while possibly confused by the manner Jesus came in, was still excited. This new prophet who had traveled around Judea and Galilee for three years was now coming into the capital city, Jerusalem. And, and guess what time it was? It was Passover time. This is, this is liberation time. Time to remember the story of, of Yahweh rescuing, yes, rescuing Israel from slavery and, and looking forward to the day when Yahweh would once again free them from their current oppressors, Rome. So they cried, Hosanna, Hosanna. And just like their ancestors had done with Judah the hammer, they waved palm branches as Jesus of Nazareth rode into the city. Now let us fast forward a few days in the scene where Jesus has been on trial with Pilate. And it's, it's now in front of the crowds as the Roman governor asks the crowd what he should do with Jesus. And we see them ask for a man called Barabbas. Who was Barabbas? Well, first, let's look at his name. His name, Bar. This is two Barabbas. It's Bar Abbas. Bar means son of, and Abbas, Abba, is father. His name is son of the father. And while many of your English translations don't reflect this, some do, and you can check yours to see if yours does, but many of the earliest manuscripts of Matthew actually give us Barabbas' first name. You want to know what it was? Jesus. His name was Jesus Barabbas. Jesus, son of the Father. The crowd was presented with a choice between two Jesuses. And, and another thing, if you didn't already know this already, Jesus' name, Yeshua, is the Aramaic form of the Hebrew name Joshua or Yahashua. Joshua. Jesus was named after the old Hebrew hero who went in and in a sweeping campaign fueled by violence and war wiped out many of the Canaanites from the promised land so Israel could set up shop. So now the crowd is presented with a choice, a choice between two Joshuas. Keep this in mind as we proceed. But who was Barabbas? To understand the identity of Barabbas is to bring the tragedy of Good Friday into sharp focus. Perhaps sharper than we would like. In understanding Barabbas, films like The Passion of the Christ have done us a great disservice. Barabbas was not a deranged serial killer. Why would the crowd ever clamor for the release of a common murderer? Remember my confusion as a child? When, these, when the cheering crowd went to, the clam, went to clamoring for Barabbas. I read the story and there's nothing that Jesus does that would lead the crowds to randomly turn on Jesus. And, and definitely nothing that would make them prefer a common murderer instead. You can imagine my confusion as a child and, and probably or possibly even relate. If we imagine Barabbas as this homicidal maniac, we will never imagine ourselves among the crowd shouting, Give us Barabbas! But we're meant to. We, we should see ourselves in the crowd shouting, Give us, give us Barabbas! Barabbas wasn't a common criminal, he was a national hero. Barabbas wasn't a serial killer. He was a political prisoner. Barabbas wasn't a murderous bandit. He was a revolutionary leader. Barabbas was a Jewish insurgent who had led an insurrection against the Roman occupation and who had killed someone during the uprising 
It wasn't just a random murderer. He had killed someone. But it was in an uprising against Rome. It was in defense of Israel. More than likely, the person he killed was a Roman soldier or a Jewish collaborator. Barabbas would have been viewed as a popular hero among many of Jerusalem's population who longed for liberation from foreign occupation by whatever means. Barabbas was what Judah the Hammer was two centuries before. Someone who would use violent force in order to free Israel. Barabbas wasn't the Boston Strangler. Barabbas was the William Wallace or the George Washington. This is important because it casts Barabbas in an entirely different light. And therefore the crowd. This Jesus Barabbas is a different kind of Messiah. He's a rival Messiah. And on Good Friday, the crowd and subsequently us were given a choice between two Jesuses, two Joshuas. Jesus Barabbas or Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus of Nazareth calls for the way of peace by by loving our enemies and the practice of radical forgiveness. Jesus Barabbas is willing to fight our wars and willing to kill in the name of freedom. Recently, a well-known megachurch pastor said, when I'm looking for a leader, I want the meanest, toughest son of a gun I can find. Whether he understands it or not, this pastor is saying, give us Barabbas. For many American Christians, the politics of Jesus are dismissed as impractical. And so they kick the can down the road saying, well, maybe someday we can turn our our swords into plowshares. But now is the time for us to wage war on our enemies across the world. The crowd that gathers on Good Friday shouting, give us Barabbas. We don't want your man be Pamby, Jesus. Why? Because ultimately, we don't believe in Jesus. Sure, we believe he existed. Sure, we believe that he died for, for my, my sins and that he's there to save my soul. But we don't believe in Jesus because we don't believe in his ideas. The crowd didn't believe in Jesus' ideas either. The Sermon on the Mount is is nice in theory, but, but now is the time for Rome to be defeated. Now is the time for Israel's vindication. They wanted a Joshua the Canaanite killer, or a new David who would wage war against the Philistines, or a Judah the Hammer who would defeat and resist the Syrians. Jesus didn't do this. He wouldn't do this. He didn't pick up a sword. In fact, he told his hot-headed disciples not to live by the sword. He didn't declare war on Caesar. He didn't even declare war on King Herod. As he entered the city riding on a donkey's colt, he cried. It says he wept. And he said, if... If only you'd known on this day, even you, Jerusalem, what peace meant. But now it is hidden, and you cannot see it. He didn't wage war. He didn't pick up a sword. And because he didn't and wouldn't, they shouted for Barabbas. This man will wage war for us. This man will stop at nothing to bring in a version of God's kingdom which consisted of defeating Roman power by Roman means. In other words, repaying pagan violence with holy violence. Knowing all of this, it is much easier to realize how the crowd went from shouting, Hosanna! Hosanna! To crucify him. Crucify him! Give us Barabbas in such a short amount of time. But it's not only enlightening as it answers the question I posed at the beginning. It is also convicting. 
Because how often do I expect God to be something I want him to be? Or to work in the ways that I want him to work? How often do I try to reform Jesus into my own image? Forgiving enemies sounds nice in theory, but it is much harder to do in practice. Whether those enemies be in your own workplace or a people group on the other side of the world, we find ourselves crying out, give us Barabbas. We want a Messiah who will fight for me and in the way and manner I want him to. We would rather have any enemy fighting Barabbas than enemy accepting, enemy welcoming, enemy lifting, enemy equalizing, enemy loving Jesus. We find ourselves much like the character of Jonah. In Jonah chapter 4, the, the holy man of God, Jonah who didn't want his God to forgive the evil, depravity-ridden Ninevites. This man of God, who didn't want his God to forgive his enemies. And we find ourselves crying out to God, just like Jonah did, angry. He says, I knew you were a gracious and compassionate God, abounding in love. A God who relents from sending calamity. We, the people of God, don't like it when God forgives our enemies. Forgetting that we were too once an enemy of God. Joshua, David, and the other military using leaders in the Bible, they're there. They're there in the Bible. But they, they aren't the culmination of God's plan. So what does God have to say about violence and war and hatred and vengeance? Jesus is what God has to say. Jesus is what God has to say. And Jesus hung up there on the cross. And he said, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Did Jesus come to wage war? Yeah. Did, did he come to free Israel and set the captives free? You betcha. Did he come to bring an exodus like salvation for Israel and ultimately for all the world? Yes. Yes, he did. But Jesus doesn't wage war the way we'd like him to. He doesn't use violence. He doesn't use the ways of Rome to fight Rome. Jesus isn't a king like Caesar, and he will not stoop to using Caesar's ways. Because Jesus sees the real enemy. The real enemy is evil. It's sin. It's, it's idolatry. It's the thing that turns people's heart from the creator. This was who he came to wage war against and who he came to set the people free from. But once again, how does Jesus wage war? How does the prince of peace wage war? Look at Revelation. This book that is usually cited for its images of violence and war and terror, but it's a misreading by well-meaning people who aren't familiar with the genre. What, we, what do we find in the book of Revelation when we look there? There's this, there's this beautiful moment when, when one of the elders says, Behold, the Lion of Judah. Behold, the Lion of Judah. And John the visionary, he turns around. He turns around and what he's expecting to see is what was just told to him. The Lion of Judah, the Messiah from the line of Judah and the line of David, a new David. But when he turns, he, he heard, behold, the Lion of Judah. But when he turns, what does he see? It's not at all what he expects. Because sitting on the throne is not a roaring, powerful, violent beast of a lion. 
No. It's a lamb. He hears, behold, the lion of Judah, but he turns, and it's not a violent beast. It's a lamb, a tiny, vulnerable lamb. And not only a lamb, but a slain lamb. It has already been sacrificed. Later in, in the book, there's this image of Jesus showing up. And what is he riding? A white horse. And we go, finally, here he is, riding the majestic war horse. But he isn't ready for battle. Not in the way I would expect him to be anyways. Because Jesus shows up to the battle already bloody. He get, John looks closer and there's blood all over Jesus' robes. He looks like he's already been in a battle. What are these images? How does the Prince of Peace, Peace wage war? These images are, are subversions of what we as broken humans expect. They subvert the idea of exerting power through violence and force. The idea of exerting power by imposing my will onto someone else's. Jesus, God, he doesn't exert his power through force and coercion. That's how Caesar does things. Jesus exerts his power how? By self-sacrificial love. We expect a lion ready to tear through our enemies. And instead we get a lamb with a slit throat. We expect Jesus to come riding in and to slay our enemies. But instead we get a pre-bloodied Jesus. Because he died for those enemies of ours. If you'll bow your heads. Father, forgive us, for we know not what we do. Amen. Our children are going to prepare and present the living Lord's Supper, and then we will partake of communion together. Come boys and girls. Thank you.